Hey family, do you feel it's time to make a shift in your life but have no idea where to start and can use some support? Well, the time has come. My Master Life class, Strategize Your Vision, is officially open and this is your opportunity to start living the life that was designed specifically with you in mind. Strategize Your Vision is for you if you are finally ready to embrace your purpose and walk in your truth to impact the world. You are willing to do the work necessary to eliminate negative core beliefs that's blocking your progress. Or maybe you are simply ready to receive the blessings that has your name on them. Strategize Your Vision will teach you step by step how to develop a strategy that touches every area of your life to ensure your purpose and vision are in alignment. Family, you no longer have to do life alone because together we're going to get you clear on your purpose, write your vision plainly, and build a strategy for making your vision a reality. So if you're ready, I'm ready. So let's do the work together. All you have to do is visit strategizeyourvision.com to enroll today. I was so used to being broken that I didn't know what anything else was until I experienced wholeness. So it's like, I don't know what, I don't know what wholeness looks like, feel like, smells like, sound like, because I'm just so used to being broken. And when I started to experience something different, I'm like, this is what peace is like. This is what wholeness is like. But the thing is, we can only get to that place if we're willing to do the work and go beneath the surface. Hey family, I'm Kia, and you're doing Life with Lakeisha on Living Her Truth. Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Wooder from LakeishaWooder.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week, you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Takia, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. Yay, I'm super excited to be on the podcast. I'm excited to have you here. You know, every conversation I always start off with just talking about um, how I've come to know the person I'm having a conversation with, like how this particular conversation has come to pass, if you will. I like to start off every episode that way. So this episode is no different. And I ran across your story first on the Dreams and Drive podcast. Yay, I, I love so, that podcast. I love that podcast, right? Just absolutely love it. And I heard your story and was just blown away. I'm, I'm going to be 100% honest. I was probably crying throughout the whole episode, to be completely no, honest. Yeah, no. yeah. But, you know, just just happy tears. And mm-hmm. people are going to understand. We're going to go into more into your story. But just more mm-hmm. so of just happy tears. Because there are so many people who's had your exact same story who's not even here with us right now. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, you know, you're a survivor, it's just... It just brought me to tears, you know? So happy tears. It was it was happy tears for you, girl, because you're still here. And mm-hmm. then I heard you again on the Redefining Wealth podcast. Because you know Yay. Patrice is my homegirl. I love me some Patrice. Yes, that's that's my big sis mentor. She be come coming for everything. I love her. Girl, she been snatching my edges all week on these sure. videos on Instagram. Yes, I do. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I love Lisa Patrice. And she's so funny. She's like, why is everybody saying I be snatching their edges? Because girl, you're getting us together. Mm-hmm. That's why. Thank you. <laughs> you're getting us together. <laughs> Yay. So we have Raina and Patrice in common. That's awesome. We do. We do. And you know, when I heard your your story on Patrice's podcast, you know, I had already heard it before, but I don't know, it was different because the conversation was different. And I just really wanted to hone in on just some of the key points that I that I heard in in your conversation with, with Patrice, which is why we're here today. And because I know from listening to your story, me personally, 
I have become very cognizant on using the term depression, very cognizant, or just saying, oh, I'm depressed, or I'm just so haphazardly without really necessarily taking the the severity of it into consideration, right? And I think that a lot of us, we use that term loosely, some of us use it loosely, and I don't think we should. After listening to your story, I'm very kind of saying, because I was just having a conversation with a, with a friend, and I said, you know, girl, i just been so depressed. I was like, you know what? No, I haven't been depressed. Let me just really call it for what it is, right? Because I don't want to downplay that word. So I really wanted to have that conversation with you because I love the fact that you are changing how you're teaching people how to change how they speak about depression and, and suicide because the words that we speak gives power, right? Mm -hmm. This life and death and the power of the tongue. And so the fact that you are teaching people, you know, how to speak about these things, I love that because I'm just in this season right now personally where I am like, challenging the status quo, if you will, or I'm just like reevaluating some of my core beliefs and not necessarily negative core beliefs, but just beliefs that have, have me having has done well for me up until this point. I'm just questioning. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a part of me operating in purpose and the fact that my purpose is growing and evolving and evolving. So with that evolution comes the growth of my mindset and me seeing things mm -hmm. in a different way in a different way, right? To expound my experience and my knowledge and my ability to learn. So I, I just really wanna just hone in on that and have that conversation with you on today. But I think that we should start off because people are probably really confused now at this point. <laughs> what is it we talking about? But I think that we should um, just start off with you just you know, telling us your, your amazing story for those who, who hasn't, you know, heard your story before. Yes, so I'm like, where do I even begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to speed up, to bring it to the point where we were talking about depression and suicide, I would say that I started struggling with suicidal thoughts at around like 11 or 12. But as a child, I didn't know that it was called suicide. I just knew that as a child, I thought about ways of ending my life and often wanted to die. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't, I wasn't able to name what it was, but I just knew the thoughts and the feelings that I had. And then I remember around the time I was like 14, and I don't remember in particular what was happening at the time, but I knew it was very like impulsive. I had took a bottle of, pills and I like put them in my mouth and I like heard someone coming and I like spit them out so that was like the first time where I was just like I had this it was very impulsive I don't know exactly what was going on at the time but I do realize that a lot of the times where I did feel extremely anxious or suicidal it was often when my mom would get into um like a physical or even a verbal altercation with my sibling set and the reason why I don't say stepdad is because he's, he was never, he never played that role for me. So I just referred to him as my sibling's dad. And so the older I became, um, the thoughts were always there, but I've learned to suppress them. Like a lot of us, we learn how to suppress things. And so around like 24 or 25, the thoughts just became really louder. And I was like, I cannot do this anymore. It became like mentally and emotionally exhausting having to talk myself out of ending my life because I'm like, this is so exhausting. Like I'm already don't have the energy to do simple things like get out of bed, take care of my hygiene, eat, I'm basically bedridden. And I was like, I can't do this. I'm tired of this internal battle with myself. So it would just be better if I wasn't here. And so at that time, I texted a friend and I was like, it would be better if I wasn't here or if I wasn't alive. Mm -hmm. And but that friend didn't know at the time that I already had taken all these substances. And I, at that time, I was waiting to die. And in that moment, while I was waiting to die is when the police showed up. And when they came into my apartment, well, first they broke into the window. 
and they were like, can you make it to the door? But I was extremely weak because I didn't have anything to eat or drink in like maybe three or four days. And I was able to make it to the door. And when they evaluated me, they was asking me like, did you try to hurt yourself? And I told them, well, I already tried and like, it's not working or like I'm waiting for it to work, something along those lines. And they were like, you're a threat to yourself. You know, when was the last time you had anything to eat or drink? Because I was extremely weak and fragile. And I told them, I said, maybe three or four days ago. And they were like, well, we can handcuff you and force you to the hospital or we can call the paramedics and they can transport you. And so I agreed to have them call the paramedics. And when I got to the hospital, the psychiatrist evaluated me and I didn't know like everything. Like I knew, I, I don't think I really knew why I was there at the time. I just said, oh, maybe they just bringing me here for whatever. But I remember him asking me like, do you know who the president is? And I, at the time I was like, yeah, I know Obama's, uh, Barack Obama's the president. But they would ask me like, do you know what, what today's date is, what the time is? And I didn't know. Like, I, like I, at that time it was like, it was a gradual like fading away of my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were like, well, we can offer you two options. Either you can commit yourself and it'll give you more control over the process, but you have to go into the psychiatric unit um, because you're a threat to yourself and you're not mentally stable. Or if you don't commit yourself, the um, we will, where essentially the state comes in and the state has you. And so I didn't know what I was signing up for, but I just said, if you said it gives me more control over the process, then okay. And that's what really started my journey to like healing um, from, you know, my childhood trauma to becoming self-aware, to truly understanding what mental illness is. In my case is major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. And that's really what started to open the door. And I think before that, I really did limit mental illness to like people that was like just talking to themselves mm -hmm. and walking down the street, not realizing that there's a huge spectrum um, of what it looks like. And I remember at the time saying to one of the ladies at the hospital, I said, I don't belong here. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I don't belong here. Like I have a degree from Howard. I have a master's from Georgetown. Like people like me don't come here because in my mind I was too educated or too accomplished to be able to be in a place that I was told as a child growing up that it was for crazy people. So that that's truly was a life changing moment in my life where I had to decide that everything that I was doing up until that point no longer served me. And I had to, learn new ways to cope with my depression, learn new ways how to deal with stress because I was really not doing well. And I would have never classified myself at the time as being mentally ill, but at the time I was. Oh, wow. It's, oh, there's so much I want to I want to ask and, and cover just based off of what you what you just said. But first off, the at the time where the police officers broke into your apartment, was there anything in particular that happened at that point to cause you to go into that depressive state? Because initially the suicidal thought started when you was younger, just based off the fact that your mom was being abused, correct? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. was there anything in particular that that happened that even caused you to, to go into that depression at that particular time? Or was it just the residual of the unresolved trauma? I think it was a combination. So it was unresolved childhood trauma, but then it was also, it's basically like, um, you know, essentially like the straw that broke the camel's back. We hear that. So it was the combination of things and it just became stuff on top of stuff. So it was not dealing with, you know, my dad being um, on drugs and in and out of jail my mom being abused, recently graduating uh, at the time with my master's and, you know, struggling financially, not being able to make ends meet. Um, it was just a lot happening at that time. And I, I just felt extremely hopeless. I'm like, okay. And at the time, my mom was still with the guy. So it wasn't just like, oh, it happened in my childhood. It was like still happening currently. 
so often worried about my mom and my siblings. I'm the oldest of seven. So to be able to kind of have that weight and saying like, I need to be able to do something, but I'm not even in a mint. I don't have the mental, the emotional, or even the financial capacity to help my, my family. So that weighed on me a lot too. And so I was just like, I can't do this no more. This is too heavy. I would just rather not be here. Man, that's, um, uh, that's deep. An- an- another reason too, when I heard your story on dreams and drive that I was crying is because I can also relate so much to it. You know, um, I was sexually abused by my mom's boyfriend for eight years. And this is my first time referring to him as my mom's boyfriend. And you just changed that for me right now in this moment, because you said that, you know, you don't call your mom's boyfriend, stepdad. You refer to him as your sibling's father. Mm-hmm. That's deep for me because my, my mom's boyfriend, he never served in the father, in the father role either. Now he was in the house, but he still, I mean, he, he wasn't, he wasn't a father. He wasn't, he didn't stand up he wasn't living up to that role. So why am I giving him that title of stepfather? Because even though he sexually abused me, he physically abused my mom and he physically abused my brothers. That is not the role of a father. So from this moment forward, I'm no longer going to refer to him as stepfather or stepdad. He's going to be my brother's and my, my sibling's father. That's mm-hmm. what he, cause that's what he is. So thank you for that. Um, but there are so many things in our story that just um, that just lines up because I'm the first generation of every anything. <laughs> I'm just the first generation. I have 13 brothers and sisters, and I'm the oldest as well. So I'm the first to graduate wow. from high school, the first to go to co- first of everything. And so for me, the sexual abuse ended around 16 years old. And you know, fortunately for me, my stepfather went to jail for it because I went through the whole legal process of prosecuting. Uh, he was prosecuted, you know, I got on the stand, testified against him, like, I went through that whole process, and then after that, I graduated from high school, and then I'm, I was literally thrust into college, I don't want to make it seem like it was a bad thing, because it was a good thing, but I was thrust into college with all of this baggage, like, it wasn't just the sexual abuse, I grew up in a project, so it was so much going on that I had witnessed, and I had seen, Mm -hmm. and so I'm dealing with this, then I went to school in Atlanta, I moved there from, you know, from Chicago. So that was like a a huge like transition because now I'm away from family that I've always been around. And so now I'm by myself. So I can, so I was literally like going through that journey with you because I can completely understand because it was so overwhelming for me as well. You know, Um, for me, somebody was nice enough to pay for therapy sessions because they was like, you need to talk to somebody, obviously, right? Obviously, because I've had experienced all of this, all of this trauma, you know, Mm. and, and like you, I was just like, well, okay. I I was indifferent about it. I was just like, well, Hey, you're going to pay for it. Then okay. And something in me just clicked. And I was just like, let me take this seriously. Like, let me take these therapy sessions seriously. And I'm so glad that I did because that started my self-awareness. That started my self-awareness journey. And here on the podcast, we talk about unresolved trauma all the time, how that can like literally affect us. And my trauma is sexual abuse. And I know that's not everybody's story, but I just really try to get people to understand that your uh, trauma is probably not on the same level as mine, but it's still trauma. And it can be, it can be trauma that you witness, like you witness your mom, you know, go through that trauma that affects you, your dad being on, being on drugs that affected you. And I think that some people just don't make the connection that that is trauma. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to just directly affect you. You don't have to be against you personally, but the fact that you're in the room and you're experiencing it and you're growing up around it, that's trauma. Absolutely. And I think a a lot of times uh, people don't, I don't think maybe they feel like, oh, well, it didn't happen to me. So Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not my stuff. But if you've witnessed it, then you are a person who have it, who has experienced trauma. Um, And I think the biggest thing is when we don't, 
when we don't realize how trauma impacts us, mm -hmm. people don't realize that what we often do is we act our, our pain. So we may not say I'm hurting or I'm, or I'm feeling depressed or this thing is you know too much to handle we may not have the exact words but a lot of times we act it out so it's through our actions that our trauma is coming to the forefront but we don't even realize that's what we're doing absolutely and then people when i say people the people that surround that person that's acting it out we don't even recognize it, right? Or, you know, we, we see them acting out and we tell them, girl, just stop. Like, why are you acting like that? There's nothing wrong with you. And the fact that even you, when you said that you was in the, the psychiatric hospital, you said, right? I don't belong here. I got this degree from, from Howard. I got this degree from Georgetown. Why am I here? Like, I shouldn't be here. And I can't even relate to that because I'm going through all of these emotions when I'm in college, I'm going through all these emotions. And then I, I get home and people, my family, God bless they so they put me on this pedestal because I'm the first one to make it. And now I feel like I'm having imposter syndrome because I'm coming home. I'm the one that's made it. So everybody's like, oh, you know, she coming home, she coming home. But then I go to Atlanta and I'm battling with all of these emotional this emotional trauma that I've been going through and trying to like figure it out. And so even with me in my head, I'm like, but I got out of the ghetto. Why am I feeling like this? And it's just like, because you need to deal with this, sweetie. Like mm -hmm. that's why, but no, like my family never really sat down to like really talk about it and, and address it. Like I had to do all of that on my own. And I think that's a mistake that, that we make by, by ignoring the signs that we see in our family members. Just yeah, and that's, like it's not. absolutely, Act, acting like, oh, it's, it doesn't happen or it doesn't exist, but that's how trauma is passed down. Yes. And we're still dealing with the trauma from slavery, whether we realize it or not. Girl. So it's like, we have trauma on top of trauma, years upon years of trauma, and it's not just the trauma that we're currently facing. So mm -hmm. it's unpacking all of that. And it's not until we address our trauma that we can actually start to operate, I believe, in our fullness. It's very different to, you can tell. Now I can tell that I'm in a, a much better place. I can tell when someone is operating out of a place of brokenness versus wholeness. Mm. So because you're often, when you're broken, a lot of times we're looking for validation Mm -hmm. It's insecurities, trying to have, be in a relationship uh, for someone to fill certain voids, um, not feeling good enough, feeling guilty about things. And so once I started to look at that and I look at where I am now, I'm like, oh my gosh, it is, it is mind blowing to me the, of where I am now, because I never thought in a million years because I was so used to being broken that I didn't know what anything else was until I experienced wholeness. So it's like, I don't know what, I don't know what wholeness looks like, feel like, smells like, sound like, because I'm just so used to being broken. And when I started to experience something different, I'm like, this is what peace is like. This is what wholeness is like. But the thing is, we can only get to that place if we're willing to do the work and go beneath the surface. Yes, absolutely. You know, I have a master life class called Strategize Your Vision. In that class, I talk about embracing change, you know, and I talk about embracing change in, you know, in different areas of our life. And it's because how do you know better if you don't experience it? Like you mm -hmm. literally may have to change where you live, change the way you think, change the people that you, you know, hang around, change the place where you worship. Like you have to experience that change. You have to embrace it. You have to welcome it because even with me, like I, I did, I didn't know better. I was raised in the projects, but it, once I went to Atlanta and people laugh at me when I tell them all the time, it was a culture shock. And I went to HBCU. That was a culture shock for me because the black people where I came from wasn't doing all this great stuff. <laughs> I was like, like, I was like, I felt like the eyeball out, you know? So mm -hmm. to 
go to a place where it's all these beautiful people that look like me, you know, that's of this different mindset and, and doing better for themselves or whatever. That was a shock for me. But it wasn't until I was in that environment that I realized that there is better out here. Mm -hmm. But we Absolutely. have to be willing to, like you say, do the inner work. And a lot of us, we don't, we don't want to do it, right? Because it hurts. I ain't gonna lie. Mm -hmm. Doing the inner work, it's hurt. It hurts. And it's hard. Like, mm -hmm. let's be real. Because you're gonna have to address some things that are scary, you know, um, and hurtful. And we don't want to do that. But I will say that I feel like we're we're coming to an age where we're being more aware and accepting of it um, through self-care, right? Mm -hmm. Which is which is great, which is great. And I'm probably going to get some, get some slack on this. But I feel like even with that being said, I feel like we're in this women's empowerment, empowerment movement right now. So I feel like self-care is like a trending topic, if you will. It's like the cool thing to say. But do we really know what it means and what it entails right i'm Just, so what, glad what's your thoughts on that i'm so glad you brought that up so i had wrote an article on my website and it was and i did a podcast episode on it and it was saying sis you're doing self-care wrong um because the thing is when it comes to self-care we a lot of times we like to limit it to like getting our hair done our nails mm -hmm. done eyelashes mm -hmm. and all that stuff is definitely a part of self-care but what i've learned is that there are two types of self-care like there's the self-care that is like very mindless which is like get your hair done get your nails done get your feet mm -hmm, done mm -hmm. go get a massage that's like very mindless but then you're talking about the self-care that is actually uh requires work where it's like a work self-care that is going to therapy that is learning to set boundaries that is becoming self-aware that is removing toxic people from your life um, uh, going to the gym because that's work that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned to say like, okay, is this my work self care or this is like my mindless self care? Because I always say we can, you can do everything in the mindless self care in the sense of getting your nails and your toes and your eyebrows done and all that stuff is great. But what good is that if you're still broken and you're dealing with depression and you have unresolved childhood trauma? Like the mini and the petty not going to do nothing for you. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that we realize that, well, yes, we want to make sure that our outer appearance is good and that we look good so we can feel good. Mm -hmm. But then also making sure that, okay, do I have some insecurities, some voice that I actually need to address? Do I need to let go of toxic family members or friends? Um, what, what are those things that I have to do internally? And that's a part of self-care that people don't, they don't make that connection. They don't. And then, and for those who do, who, who, you know, go to therapy, I'm probably jumping ahead, right? Cause let's just get people in, in the therapy chair. Let's just, let's just start there. But I feel like for those of us who do go to therapy, are you implementing what you learn in the therapy session? Girl. Cause it's one thing to go and talk about it, but are you going home and implementing what it is that you learn? So if you, uncover this negative core belief and you turned it around for for positive then why are you still going home and looking in the mirror and don't like what it is that you see girl it's a, it's a totally it's a totally different it's a totally different thing we have to do <laughs> you are no you preach it because i say that all the time i'm like therapy is great and i'm always encouraging it but if you're not putting into practice what you learned about yourself it's a waste of time and a waste of money. I mean, the therapist getting paid regardless, but mm -hmm. for you, it's an investment. Mm -hmm. So it's really taking that time to say like, you know what? I, I know like for me, perfect example. And this is a part of, you know, my self care. I had a very hard time learning to accept like my stomach, but that didn't even start like as an adult. That was like a child at like 11 or 12 years old. I always felt like, my stomach looked like, I don't know, like a little pack of Vienna sausages or something. I don't know. I just, as a child, <laughs> I just never liked my stomach. Like, it just, when I looked down, it's just like, it was like shame, disgrace, like what I, what I saw. Mm -hmm. And I remember 
up until I was like maybe 24 or 25 when I first started seeing the therapist that I have now, she's like, I want you to go home and um, I want to challenge you to look in the mirror at yourself naked. And I was like, you want me to do what? Like, Number girl, please five. don't. Right. Because I used to take showers and go in the bathroom in the dark. So that way, when I walk past the mirror, I don't have to see my stomach. Yes. Girl, stop. Really? Yes. And girl, yes, it is. It, it was super deep for me. And it was one day I said, you know what? I'm going to just do it with she, you know, because I know at the end it's for me. So I stood in the mirror. I didn't have on any clothes. And I remember saying to myself, I'm so sorry for not honoring you. I'm so sorry that I did not take care of you. And, but I thank you for getting me this far because even though I didn't like necessarily from the neck up, I'm like, yeah, I'm good. But when you got from here down, I was, it just was really hard for me to accept it. And I said, but you know what? I said, I thank you for getting me this far and moving forward. I will make sure that I honor my body and honor myself. And it was like a life changing thing for me because now when you're talking about self love, and that confidence that, you know, exudes from the inside out. Because I would take all of these like self-esteem quizzes and it would tell me I had above average self-esteem. But I was like, I, I don't know how that's possible when I can't accept this one part of my body. And I said, you know what? If you don't like something, of course, we can work on changing it. But at the same time, I still have to be grateful what it is for what I have and where I currently am. And from that moment forward, like I didn't, it didn't bother me anymore. And now I, yeah, I look at myself all the time. I'd be like rose and all. I mean, granted, I'm, I've definitely lost almost 70 pounds in the past year and a half. So yes. So, I mean, of course that's part of it, but the other part of it is like, yeah, those roles are still there. And I'd be like, Hey girl, how you doing? We still working. I really mastered how to like put my jeans on a certain way. So I didn't have to see like my stomach through my jeans. And now I don't care. I wear high waisted jeans and it may, you know, pudge a little stick. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I don't care. Um, but it takes a certain level of work that you have to do to to get to the point to accepting all of you it's it's not good enough that I can only accept oh my face like oh I'm pretty I have a nice face but my face is only one part of my body mm -hmm. and to be able to get to the point where I can accept all of me is huge and now yeah I know that I, I I'm working and continuing to um love myself because one of the things that I do is I get up at 4 30 in the morning yes i do to go work out at five o'clock in the morning and that's my time too it's not just about looking a certain way and working out but it's also one it helps manage my stress it helps to manage my anxiety it helps to manage my depression and that's also a time for me to decompress and fill my cup up because i'm constantly pouring and giving to other people mm -hmm. um and so it took me a really long time to get to that point, but it was again because of therapy. And I remember someone said something to me, it was a family member. They were like, I started going to therapy and, and I'm not seeing or doing the stuff that you're doing. And I had to tell them, look, you just started therapy a couple months ago. I've been with the same therapist for four and a half years. Hold on, uh, take, take a pause right there because I want you to say that again. Because I think that a lot of people think if I go to therapy for 30 days, I will, I will be good. But say that again for the people in the background. <laughs> yes. How long have you been in therapy? I've been in therapy for four and a half years consistently. Like before it was like on and off and not really, but no, consistently like clockwork. Every week I am in at my therapist's office. And it's something I actually look forward to. Like now it's you know and it makes me proud to think about where I've where I've come from mm -hmm. I would have never thought in a million years like I every time I think about it I just get so emotional because I'm like how I went from hating life mm -hmm. like completely hating life to attempting to end my life to now being so hopeful and optimistic about the future and now you see 
Now you see why I was crying that first time I heard your story. <laughs> now you see why I was crying. <laughs> Cause I saw that too, girl. <laughs> It's a great thing to be to be able to be in that space. It's like every time I think about it, Lakeisha, I just it just I I just get so like it's this feeling of gratitude and it's this feeling of thank God for sparing my life because I think about all the people who I'm like, oh Lord, hold the tears back. I think about all of the people who I remember, there's a podcast called um, Blessed and Bossed Up. And um, the host, Tatum, to me, uh, she, she really merges faith and entrepreneurship. And I remember one time I was texting her and she told me that think of all of the people whose breakthrough, um, whose breakthrough and their purpose and everything is contingent upon you saying yes to God and working on your healing. And don't I said, don't, don't make me bust out in the praise <laughs> dance right now. Don't make me bust out in the praise dance right now. But think about it. It's so true because sometimes people's blessings and breakthrough are attached to us saying yes. Yes. I know this. And this, this is another reason why I'm doing this particular doing this podcast because I want people to understand that you have to say yes to your purpose because your purpose is not just for you. There's a void in this world that only you can feel and you say yes to your purpose every single day because there is somebody waiting on you. And I know this because for a long time, I ran with, I ran for my purpose because I knew my purpose. Okay. So growing up, I always wanted to be Perry Mason. You probably have no idea because you, you know, you probably have no idea who Perry Mason is, but I do not. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a show that came on way back in the day and Perry Mason is an attorney who never lost the case. So for a long time, I wanted to be the next Perry Mason, i.e. an attorney, but I knew that that wasn't my purpose. I knew my purpose was sharing my story of surviving sexual abuse and how to, you know, use that experience in a positive way to become more self-aware and more determined to achieve whatever it is God has for me in my life. I knew that was my purpose, but I ran from that. Number one, because I wasn't healed at the time. I needed to address it and I hadn't done it and I didn't want to. And who wants to go life talking about sexual abuse? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want that. But it wasn't until I embraced my purpose that things started to fall in place for me. And I started to help other women, the children who I've been able to just help to just speak up and talk about the fact that they was being abused so they can get out of their situations. That was because I, you know... Had the, had the courage to just speak about it, to become a speaker and to just like speak about it. So I, oh my goodness. So I, so that's, I love the fact that you are walking and operating your purpose, but that is hard. Like, I know you go through therapy or whatever, and I know my process for really getting to the point of really embracing it, but talk to the person right now who knows a purpose and they don't want to say yes to it because it's still, because it's tied to something really, really painful in their lives. Because mine is tied to sexual abuse. Yours is tied to depression and suicide. Like that's not really, you know, just hearing it like that, it's not encouraging people to operate in their purpose. So take a moment to talk to that person who's, you know, running from their purpose because it's still tied to something painful. Like, what, what would you say to that person? I would say first, you know, before they even get out and start to create a platform and create a business or whatever it is for them, first, it comes with being honest with ourselves and realize that it is not your fault, number one, Mm -hmm. and it did not happen to you, it happened for you, to be able to change the narrative, because when we say it happened to us, we give the trauma or the person who caused the trauma the power. And it's about taking our power back to say, you know what? You know what? I'm not responsible for the things that happened to me. I'm not responsible for the sexual abuse. I'm not uh, responsible for growing up in the hood. 
I'm not responsible for any of that. But what I am responsible for is my healing. Nobody can do it. Nobody can do it but us. And so I think it's important that before, you know, it is, yes, it's very scary. And it, it may seem very abstract to see, to think about what can life be like once I'm healed and I'm whole. But think about all the things that you can't do right now and the things that are stopping you because you're like, I can't do this, I'm too afraid. But the minute we start to speak life into ourselves and the minute that we start to take our power back and do the work, and so I'm always gonna advocate to go to therapy so we can start getting to the root of those things that hinder us, the things that stop us from living our best lives. Because a lot of us say we live in our best lives on social media, but, we, but what we're living is our best life. And Woo. it's <laughs> y'all heard, turn turn the radio up turn it turn 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 it up turn the volume up on or your on your cell phone or wherever device you're listening right now because because I don't think you heard what she said <laughs> she said on social media you say you live in your best life but honestly in real life you live in your best lie yeah because we are trying to keep up with what everybody else is doing or put on this facade like we got it all together. I know because I've been there. So I think it's important that in order to walk into the fullness that God has for you and to walk into your purpose, it's going to take some very hard work, but then also connecting with other people who have done the work and are still doing the work so that you can get encouragement from them. Um, it's one thing to be able to ask somebody for advice or try to be around other people who are not doing their work. No, they can't relate and they don't know what it's like. And they may tell you, girl, don't go to therapy. You know, that's what crazy people are. Ain't nothing wrong with you. Just pray about it. You'll be all right. No, those are not the people that you want to be around because those are people who are still stuck in their brokenness. And so you want to be around people who will encourage you to be the best version of yourself. Absolutely. And, th and that's another reason why, I share my story now because I want women to know that because there are still grown women right now who were sexually abused as a child that haven't even dealt with it. They haven't, you know, healed from it, haven't went to a therapist and they're literally successful. These are successful women. Mm -hmm. and like, you know, the, the, the effects of the unresolved trauma is affecting them and they know why, but they just too scared to even talk about it. So I show up and I share my story so women can see that there is healing on the other side. There is healing. You can literally have a happy, healthy relationship in marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can absolutely heal from sexual abuse. But I also wanted to add to that too, because think about it in terms of whether it's sexual abuse, no matter what the trauma is, just think right. about this. When we don't take the time to heal our stuff, if we have children, nine times out of 10, we're passing that on to our children. And we don't even realize it, like how we're acting. And we, that's not to say we're not being the best parent that we can be. Of course, we're doing, like, I believe my mom did the best she could with what she had. I would never say that my mom was not a good parent. Um, but I will say that sh should, if she would have taken the time to heal and work on certain, certain things, my life could have been completely different. And we don't realize how that when we don't take the time to heal, it really spills over into every area of our life and especially our children. And think about us. A lot of us are who we are today because of the trauma that our parents didn't deal with. So we're talking about, you know, our parents being, you know, our mom being abused, not taking the time to actually work on their healing. And now, we're victims of things that happen to them. And so it's important that as parents, parents take, and I'm not a parent, but parents take the time to do their work so that their children don't have to deal with the burden and the weight of them not dealing with their own trauma. You know what? Thank you so much for uh, bringing that up because there's a lot of parents out there who are, I feel as though stand in these toxic situations for their kids because they feel as though they should stay in a situation because they don't want to break up the happy home, you know, because that will mess up their child. But 
what you have to realize is that your child is watching you taking notes and learning how to negatively deal with that toxic situation. So by you staying in that situation, it's doing more harm than good. So I'm so glad that you that you brought that up because mom, dad, I don't have kids yet either, but it's like mom, dad, if you think that you are hiding it well from your child, I'm telling tell you, I'm telling you right now, you're not. And this is just me speaking from a child who saw their parent be abused. You know, yeah. I, I heard it at night when you thought that I was sleeping upstairs sleep. No, I heard it. I, I hear y'all talking. Your child don't like, I feel like sometimes we, we underestimate the smartness of a child. <laughs> the intelligence of children like they're picking it up and they're soaking it in and they're growing up and they're mimicking what they saw as a child like yeah. you have to like it starts with self-awareness and it starts with you taking care of you mm -hmm. take care Absolutely. of you you're gonna teach your child to do the same thing so i'm glad you i'm glad you brought that up and i pray that that helps somebody um, and releases some tension from somebody. I just pray that this this whole episode, this whole conversation helps somebody out there. So thank you so much once again for saying yes to having this conversation with me. Thank you so much, Takia. Absolutely. I'm, I'm always grateful that I have the opportunity to share my story because I believe that every time I share my story, it helps to dismantle the mental health stigma and it helps to set somebody else free and to be able to get the help that they need. Absolutely. But before I let you go, I do want to ask you two final questions. Of course. So, um, first of all, give us a book recommendation of a book that, or Audible, that has impacted your life in a positive way. Well, this is a shameless plug, but I have to put my book in there, of course. <laughs> go ahead, throw it in there. <laughs> because it is, of course, about my life. And it did change the way because I'm not going to even, I'm not going to even lie. So in September mm -hmm. of 2019, mm -hmm. I uh, went into a terrible episode of depression um, because I was not on my medication and I became extremely suicidal and I was at risk for having another suicide attempt. Mm. And I started reading my book and I mean, I know the book, like, okay, not to say, like, I don't know what's in it, but I started reading through the pages, and I started crying as I was reading through my book, and I said, not only, girl, is this a good book, but, like, look at all that you've, you've overcome, and it's like, you've, you've overcome this before, and it's my hope and prayer that depression does not have to be a lifelong thing for me, because it's been over 12 years that I've been dealing with it. But I was just like, you know what? It gave me the encouragement to be like, it's okay, girl, to take that medication. Like, I, I cannot function without it. I become a completely different person. And the reason why I want to say that, because I want to encourage some person to know that therapy is okay. Mm -hmm. But for those of us who need medication to take care of our mental health, that is okay, too. Because it's a chemical imbalance in the brain for some of us. Sometimes it's because of trauma. Sometimes it's because if a, if a woman has to, to be pregnant. Sometimes it's, again, for us, it could just simply be the way that our makeup is with our DNA and our chemicals. But no matter what it is, it's okay to take the medication. And you may not need it forever. And I'm talking to myself because I've been on it for four years, and I do not like taking it. But I know if I don't take it, I'm going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage someone to just pick it up. Um, the title of the book is Saved and Depressed. So y'all know I talk about the church a little bit and wanting to, to challenge the church and encouraging people to know that just like you can be saved and have diabetes, you can be saved and deal with depression. Um, because for some reason, we like to disconnect our brain from everything else when our brain controls all of our body mm -hmm. and so I would encourage someone to pick up that book for themselves or either a family member or a friend to help give them that hope and encouragement to know that it's okay to seek help 
for your mental health and it's okay to be like, I'm not okay. It's okay to not be okay. You know what? Thank you for, um, for sharing that, sharing the fact that you've been dealing with, with depression for 12 years, because I don't want people to miss over the fact that Takiyah has been dealing, dealing with this for 12 years, but God has still been using her. Mm-hmm. Please do not skip over that fact. Please don't get hung up off the fact that she's been dealing with depression for 12 years. Let's really hone in on the fact that God has still been using her despite of. So just because you think that you are flawed in some type of way because you experienced something or did something in the past, God can still use you. Mm -hmm. You just have to say yes to your purpose. Absolutely. And work. Period. So please don't overlook that fact that she just said that. So thank you for sharing that. And then one last thing, when describing the meaning of living your truth, what is your third word when you hear these two words put together? Okay. And those two words are purpose, self-awareness, and what would be your third word to round it out? Purpose, self-awareness, mm-hmm. peace. Mm. Because when we know our purpose and we become self-aware, there's a certain level of peace that we have. And you didn't ask for a fourth word, but wholeness comes to mind as well. Yes, I can definitely relate to that. Peace and wholeness. Because once I embraced it, I was at, I was at peace with it. Because I knew that it was my assignment and I was equipped to, to handle it in the best way possible and my purpose even though it was tied to is tied to sexual abuse is not meant to you know make me think less of myself it's not meant to uh, make me look a certain way negatively in somebody else's eyes that's not what it's for right so I felt peace once I accepted it and I felt whole I felt whole so thank you for that that's awesome You're awesome. Thank you.